I knock at the door of your heart and ask, if you open the door, I'll come in and eat with you and you with me. So we see the, 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 the correct perspective is that heaven is knocking on our door. And, and in, in, in many instances, it's not necessarily evil things or bad things that are keeping us from him, but it's just things, things like TV and phones and conversations and business and, and all these other things that are a necessary part of life. And yet, I, I want us to approach the, the, the subject of seeking God from the perspective that God wants to meet with you more than you want to meet with Him. Because some Christians, like I said, they bring their, this perspective to prayer where they're begging and they're crying out to God and oh God and they're screaming and they're going hoarse and... You, you, you know, I remember one lady telling me that, you know, if you get up every two hours during the night to pray, God will really meet with you. And listen, God will meet with you when you pray. But you know what? We can bring a legalistic aspect to prayer. Fact is that man, her husband, he was nearly about to lose his mind because he couldn't get any sleep because she was there roaring at the side of the bed every two hours. I mean, that's like something they do too in Guantanamo Bay. It's a form of torture, you know, sleep deprivation. And if you've got children, you understand uh, my pain when, when we, we, we understand what sleep deprivation is. But... Um, <laughs> It's funny, I was talking to somebody last week and his, his, um, his one-year-old uh, girl woke him up at four o'clock in the morning and I had to laugh, you know, I, I didn't want to discourage him, but I said, you know, that same night my eight-year-old woke me at four o'clock in the morning, so <laughs> hang in there, could be long, could be a long journey, but um, faithful people seek him. So we, we dealt with last week about how uh, Christ is knocking on the door of our heart. He wants um, a, a relationship with us because Christianity is first and foremost an, in, a, an invitation to have an intimate relationship with God, our creator, because God wants to reveal himself to us. Hallelujah. And, you know, we spoke last week about how long before we ever sought God, God was seeking us. Isn't it wonderful to know that, that, that Jesus quoted 2,000 years ago, he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. God was seeking us long before we ever knew we were lost. And I think that's encouraging. You know, is that God has the blueprint, he has the big picture. We don't have to worry. You know, particularly in the times that we're in when we see so many things going on in the world. Um, you, you know that Sam, I read at the beginning, Sam 46 God is a very present help in times of trouble. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. You know that God is with us. You know, when God revealed his, himself to us in, in Matthew um, in chapter 1, it says, His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. So that is the promise that every one of us have. It, it, God never promised that we wouldn't necessarily live in troubled times. Jesus said, In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And the comfort we have is that God is with us. Amen. God with us. That is the greatest promise any one of us could ever hold on to in our lives because ultimately, you know what? They may take your money. They may take, in, in the words of William Wallace, your, your, your freedom. But you know what? They cannot take the fact that God is with us. I think was, I was reflecting on this because I think it's so beautiful that God is always with us because um, I, I remember in our old building, um, a guy came to our church one time. His wife dragged him, and, um, as you do. And um, he, he turns to her and says, this doesn't look like a church. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I understood where he's coming from, but we were doing our best. And, um, but, you know, when you look at Christianity, Christianity wasn't born in the most ideal of circumstances. Fact is, the first worship service took place in an empty tomb. Hallelujah. When, when, when God broke forth out of the shackles of death and, and, and light came out of darkness. So, you know, I think sometimes we place too much emphasis on, on outer things when the Bible's promise to us is God is with us and I believe our highest goal is is to develop that relationship with him where we we grow ever conscious ever more conscious of the fact that God is with us he is with us when we're walking to our job he's with us when our, we're in our college he's with us when we're at our job or, or at home or when we're struggling or whatever's going on God is always with us and you know what whatever laws they pass or whatever they do 
in terms of coming against Christianity. The reality is they cannot take God from you. This book I read reveals a God who is willing to meet with people in all sorts of situations. I read how in the Garden of Eden when God should have walked away, he didn't. He stayed with man. He stayed with woman. Amen. I, 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 you know, I read in, in the, um, in the, God was willing to meet with Daniel in the, in the lion's den. He was willing to meet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. He was willing to meet the people of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. He was able to meet Paul while he was locked in a Roman jail. And he wrote, you, you know, half the New Testament. So, I, you know, all of these people came to that revelation and understanding God is with us and therefore we don't have to worry hallelujah they can come up with whatever agendas they want God is with us and his truth shall prevail because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world amen that's nothing to do with the message but I think it's important to understand that and clarify that point God is with us you know they were having um, a thing in Smithfield Square yesterday and um uh, it was the Students' Union of Ireland. They were going to have the biggest uh, get-together to get into the Guinness Book of Records. There was, um, they were expecting thousands of people. Um, unfortunately, God sent the rain, and he, made, he, he turned on the air conditioning, and only 500-odd people turned up. So, um, and I mean, no disrespect to anybody, but sorry, we've already claimed Smithfield. And, and as a matter of fact, we've also claimed Dublin and Ireland and the nations of the world. So tough. So we seek God firstly because we want to be his friend. James chapter 2 verse 23 says, Abraham believed God. It was a counsel to righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Um, that's one of Jason's favorite songs. I'm a friend of God. But you know, man's highest goal I believe, is to know and glorify God. Um, you know, the old catechism had that in it. You know, man's highest goal in life is to know God and glorify Him. And you know how contrary that is to, to so much of our, our preaching where so many times we focus on what God can do for us. No, I believe our highest goal is to know Him. You know, and, and you know, particularly in a, in a generation that idolizes education and sport and accomplishments, this, this almost seems like an alien concept. And, you know, none of those things are bad. But, you know, I believe our highest goal in life is to know God. Because ultimately, we're going to be with Him for eternity. Amen. Amen. Jesus died so we could know Him. And, um, you know, that's not necessarily something we always value as a society. But like I said last week, the Bible says in Gen Genesis 5, Enoch walked with God and he was not. Because before he's gone, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And, you know, Enoch walked with God. It doesn't say he, he, he you know, he accomplished uh, something tremendous. It doesn't say that he made the New York Times bestseller list. It doesn't say that he, uh, you know, he did this or that. It just simply said he walked with God yeah. and he had a relationship with him. And, and you know, I think it's interesting because if you look back in the Garden of Eden, it says God walked with man in the cool of the day. You see, we were designed for a relationship. You weren't designed for rules. And, and, and so many people, like I said, they get delivered out of one religion and they step into another. Christianity is not a religion, it's a life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He never mentioned religion. Jesus never said, I came to you to have a religion because ultimately religion is a bit like a label and you can put whatever label you want on an empty tin and that tin is still empty and that's the way religion is in many respects it gives people a label to hide behind that says I'm this that or the other but it, it leaves them empty Jesus came that you would have life he wants you to know him he wants you to be his friend if we could turn to Luke chapter 10 and verse 38 and um, we see here Mary and Martha um, <clears throat> praise the Lord Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she, the sister, called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Amen. Um, 
I think I made a mistake uh, a couple of weeks ago when I started this whole realm of faithfulness because I started with faithful people serve. And um, I think that betrays uh, our, our mentality is, is we always put service first, really where seeking needs to come first. And it's not a question of either or um, because the reality is church would not happen without faithful people who have a heart to serve. And, and you know, serving is one of the most Christ-like things you can do. But I believe, you know, our relationship with Christ has to uh, be a priority. And, um, and, and like I said, I made that mistake of starting with serving first. And I think a lot of Christians make that mistake because we tend to substitute service for relationship. And, and, um, and, and because we're busy, sometimes we assume that everything is, that all is well. Um, but, but it's a bit like the t-shirt that says, Jesus is coming, look busy. Um, <laughs> I still find that funny 20 years later. Uh, and, and that's where a lot of Christians are with Jesus. I better start doing something. No. Uh, if Jesus is coming, then, you know, your relationship with him is so important. And this story, I think, uh, you know, betrays the humanity of, of, of Martha and her desire to do the right thing. And, um, but, you know, I think deep down, Martha, well, not deep down, Martha obviously was a little agitated. She was a little mad at her sister. But, you know, maybe deep down, Martha was kind of mad at herself. Maybe she was mad at her obsessive desire uh, to always be the one serving. And it was stopping her from having vital time with, you know, with the master. And, and you know, her passion for perfection um, was, was really distracting her from focusing on the, the one important thing um, that, that really mattered that day. And it wasn't uh, the cheesecake. It, it was spending time with Jesus, amen? Jesus said one thing is, is needed. And maybe what Jesus was alluding to was the fact that she was trying to cook a five-course meal for Jesus when Jesus said, you know, a sandwich would have been fine. <laughs> Seriously, I just ate, you know. People are always trying to feed me. Um, but, you know, good things really kept Martha from the best things. And um, I want to ask you this morning, what's keeping you from his presence? I hope that little... A drama just caused you to think about how heaven is trying to get our attention and so many things, like I said, so many times it's not the bad things, it's, it's things that are not bad or, or, or good necessarily, but it's just things that are, are keeping us from his presence. You see, there's a difference between God things and good things. And, um, you know, and, and like I said, having a heart to serve isn't bad. The fact is, it's, it's Christ-like. And, um, but our walk with him must be a priority. So like I said, it's not a case of either or, you know, we can, we can serve God and, and yet also make time for God. Um, last night we were at a, a Filipino party and, um, you know, I, I think I'm going to book a place in the Filipino area of heaven, you know, <laughs> Filipino or Mauritian, one of the two, because I tell you, <laughs> it, was, it was fun. I had so much fun last night, you know, it was, it was a bit like an Irish wedding without the drink and the fist fight. <laughs> I remember my wedding back in 99, the night before, um, a couple of guys were drinking and they got into a fist fight and there was some visitors over from England. They said, oh goody, a, a fist fight at an Irish wedding, we were expecting this, you know. Um, so there you go. Revelations chapter 2 and verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you, have left, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent to do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. It's amazing how in the first two verses, Jesus lists all the good things this church are doing. But in the process of the business of church and and, and the process of being organized and doing A, B, and C, true to Z, they, they lost something along the way, that, that first love. And, um, you know, last night Jill made, made a, a speech. Um, I, I typed out most of it for her, but it was really good. It was very touching. It was all about me, actually. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing. 20 years we've known, we've never had an argument. And um, she's a wonderful woman of God, but... Um, she, she just reminded me about how in the earlier years, 
she'd get up in the morning and I'd be walking the floor uh, just praying in the spirit and I'd have a little baby in my arms and um, I, I, you know I miss when they were little you know they'd have this small little furry head and, and they'd be either be asleep or they'd be awake just looking up at you and, and they didn't care if you were praying in tongues for an hour or two hours they just loved children can feel God's presence and um, that's before they were looking for your phone or looking for an iPad or looking for whatever they, they're just happy to be in your presence you know it was beautiful I miss that. But, um, but here God says to us, nevertheless, I have this against you. You've left your first love. God is not after what you can do for him or what you can give him. God is after you. He's after your heart. My son, give me your heart, the book of Proverbs says. And, um, you, you know, like Martha, I wonder, do some of you have a vague sense that you're missing out on something? that something is wrong, that there's something missing in your walk with him. You know, I still remember as a little, little three-year-old boy, uh, I used to walk in to my city, the, the sitting room on a Saturday. My dad used to work all week, but Saturday he'd be home and he'd watch Sunday sport or whatever. And I'd go in, I'd climb in, I'd just sit in his lap. And, and he still talks about it, how I would just sit in his lap for hours on a Saturday. I wasn't the most active child. Um, <laughs> I would happily just sit there quietly. I wouldn't say anything to him. He wouldn't say anything to me. That's, that's men for you, you know. Um, two men can get in the car, go for a five-hour journey, not say a word, get out and say, that was a great journey. See you later. <laughs> Women are not wired like that. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I was happy to be in his presence. It's like last night at the party. <laughs> the kids were just... You know, they were like locusts around the lollipops and the sweets. And at one stage, Christian came over to me and says, Dad, you know, it was like he was dying. He says, Dad, he says, I hurt in my belly. <laughs> so I just said, come here. I prayed with him. And he just sat in my lap for about 10, 15 minutes, just quite happily just sat there and cuddled with me, which is great because as they get older, it's, it's a lot harder to get them to do that. But um, because he had broken his belly, he needed to just chill for a little while. After about 10, 15 minutes, you know, I feel better again. And off he went. And I didn't see him again for the rest of the night. But, um, you know, I, I want to ask you this morning, have you been left empty by, by neglect of spiritual disciplines? You know, sometimes we're so busy, even working for God, that, that, that we neglect time with God. You know, sometimes our, our spiritual disciplines, we're just going through the motions yeah, and, and, and maybe some of you, it's not that you're not doing it, it's just you have a gnawing sense on the inside that there's more available for you. You know, sometimes we cry out to God, God, use me! Have you ever been used? Was it a nice experience? No. None of us like to be used. Why, why do we assume that God uses people? I think a better way to put it is that God involves people. Um, that God likes to involve you in what he is doing. But God doesn't use because we live in a culture where when we talk about using something, you use it till it's worn out and then you throw it away. Or if you're a Christian, you bring it to church. Um, <laughs> and, and bless somebody, bless somebody with us. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was mean. Um, <laughs> sometimes Christians are so cheap. <laughs> sorry. So my dad used to give me the privilege when I was about seven years of age of, of starting, he, had, he collected old vintage trucks. <laughs> and I remember one of my youngest memories as a child, I was probably about Jonathan's age, I was about seven, and, and I was trying to turn over this eight-cylinder petrol engine truck, it was about 1940, uh, the truck was 1940, I don't travel in time, and, um, <laughs> and it had the little bar at the front, most of you haven't a clue, I mean, you know, most of you aren't even born in the 80s, so I, anyway, I, my father was, it was freezing cold day, and, and I, I remember he was sitting inside, inside in the truck, and he turned into key, he just, come on, hurry up, and I'm like trying to turn this thing, but that's what fathers do, listen, fathers have to give you something, you know, that they, you know, if they don't, they make you a man, if they don't kill you in the process, and that's, you know, that's why, you know, all jokes aside, Kids need a father and a mother. You bring completely different things. Amen. I'm sorry, it's politically incorrect, but it's a fact. A, a man cannot give what a one, woman gives. A woman cannot give what a man gives. That's just the way God designed it. So, um, but you know, we would help our dad sell cars on a Saturday. He was a, a car salesman, so we used to go over on a Saturday and, and help him by 
trashing the place and locking ourselves inside the new cars and the boot. And <laughs> we used to do lots of, lots of things. It's like this story of a four-year-old boy and his father went to the beach. As they were walking along the beach, they come along a, 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 de a dead seagull in the sand. And the boy asks his father and he says, Dad, what happened to the birdie? The little boy is only four years of age. And, and the dad says, well, the birdie died and went to heaven. And the boy looks up and says, and God threw him back down. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter eight, verse one says, love, um, uh, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You know, there's no shortage of people in the body of Christ with lots of knowledge. But, you know, in the same way as that father was able to, to try and meet that little boy on his level, it's the same with us. We need to have that desire, you know, that to, 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 to reach people where they are. I think people should, should be able to come into church, you know, no matter what's going on in their lives. And, and we don't come down on them like a ton of bricks and list all the things that are wrong in their lives. Uh, I think the first thing people should come when they come to church is encounter love. Amen. Amen. Love and truth, yes. There's, there's, obviously, we don't hide from the truth, but I think it's important that we love people where they are. And that's why it says, uh, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. I, I've, I've met people that are a product of, of seminaries, and you know, I've come to the place, because sometimes they, they ask me, how, how did you get to where you are, and you, you haven't been to seminary? And, and, I, and I, I, I respond truthfully. I, think, I say, you know, if I'd been to seminary, I don't think I would be in ministry today. Because I talk to them and, and sometimes, you know, they have this, this kind of tunnel vision and they're just so full of legalism and rules and regulations. And I, I honestly think some people don't like people. I think one of the reasons I'm here is I like people. People interest me. I'm fascinated by people and I, I believe God's given me a love for people and I think we should love people. And when I see the way some Christians talk to people that are not saved, I think, my God, what is your problem? You know, we're not out to win arguments, we're out to win souls. Amen. That doesn't mean we, we hide truth or we compromise truth, but it just means that reaching people is paramount. Loving people is paramount. Jesus reached out to people where they were, not where they were meant to be. Listen, none of us are where we're meant to be. Amen? So I think it's important that we temper our convictions with humility. And um, so... Uh, <laughs> knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Do you have a desire to build up people? Um, some people, all they do when they go to Bible college is they get a whole lot of facts and, and, and figures. And, and the reality is the kingdom of God is full of people who have qualifications who are doing nothing for the kingdom of God. They're doing nothing to reach people. They're doing a lot to alienate people. But... To, to reach out to people. I think we need to start reaching out. And, you know, uh, personally, I think this referendum is a good thing because it's causing the church community and the gay community to start actually talking to each other, even though maybe it's a little contentious right now, but I believe God is working in the midst of all of this. Amen? Amen. So, you know, Bible school is great. I, I, I believe in Bible school. I think we've got some of the best Bible school teachers in the country here. Amen. I believe that. Jill is a wonderful... Um, Amen. woman, yeah. I know she's my mother in law, but, um, <laughs> but you know, Bible school is great, but you, but you know what the problem is? Once some people are, once many people get their certificate, that's it, they close this book, yeah. Yeah. they put it aside, they say, I've been there, got the t shirt, that's it. But you see, f first you read this book, and then you let this book read you, and that takes a lifetime. That takes a lifetime of, of studying God's word and praying about it and getting it in your heart. Your word have I hid my heart that I might not sin against you. And what I want to ask you is with all of this knowledge, what are you doing with what you have learned? How are you applying it? How are you making this world better? How are you touching other people? How are you applying it in your life personally? And, and in terms of, of, like I said, making Ireland a better place. And um, you, you see, this is the importance I think is in terms of seeking God or in terms of studying God's word, we have to be consistent. You have to be disciplined to be consistent. And you know, how many of you had a shower yesterday? Okay, three of you. This, this, is, this, is, this is a rhema word from God right now. That's, that's great. 
But how many of you know today's a new day with new needs? Today is a new day with new needs. And if you go for long without a wash, you stink. And um, that's why I think some Christians, there's a stink off them. I'm not talking about physically, but there's a stink because they haven't had a wash lately. They haven't been into the Word of God. And, and uh, that's why 1 Corinthians 8, 1, Now regarding your question about food that have been offered to idols, we know we all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. That's the new living. So, so this is why we, we crave God's presence. This is why we seek Him. Um, not out of a sense of legalism or clocking our card or because we have to, but because we want to, because we want to know Him. Psalm 27 and verse 4. One thing I've desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This is the same David that said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the midst of wickedness. David had that heart to seek God. And um, he, he had that heart, you know, he wanted to, to know God. He wanted God to, to reveal himself. Um, you know, like I said, knowledge puffs us up and makes us feel important. But it is love that, that impels us to come into God's presence. And, and this is the thing about David. David was always seeking God's heart, not God's hand. Hallelujah. If you find God's heart, you'll find God's hand. That's what I've always discovered in my life. Is that if you seek God, he, delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart. If you seek God and spend time with Him, listen, he will, he will answer your prayers before you even pray them. He'll meet your needs before you even ask. And um, verse 6 says, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in His presence. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Verse 8, When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I will seek. Hallelujah. You know, the Psalms are so beautiful because they reveal a heart that is longing after God. A heart that is hungry to know God. Psalm 14 and verse 2 says, The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who? Seek God. God is looking for people who will seek Him. God is looking for people who will seek Him, not for people who will serve Him. Because if you seek Him, you'll automatically serve Him. You won't be able to help yourself. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalm 63 verse 1 says, A psalm of David regarding a time when David was in the wilderness of Shiloh. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. You know, long before David ever connected with his cause, he connected with his creator. And I think that's a very significant point. Long before he ever connected with his cause, long before he ever said, is there not a cause? He'd already connected with his creator. And when you're connected with the creator, he has the blueprints. You don't have to be fretting and worrying. Do I do this? Do I do that? Do the other? He's already ordering your steps. He's directing you according to his plan and his purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. I think as a little kid down in Kerry, I was a little boy, you know, uh, just, just seeking God, worshiping and, and praying. And God says, you know, someday I'm going to knock all that foolishness out of your head and deal with some of the issues in your life. And I'm going to give you a wife. And then she's going to knock more of that foolishness out of you. And she's going to really make you a man. And then I'm going to open the door and you're going you're gonna to preach in Dublin, in Smithfield. I think that's pretty cool. God knows the end from the beginning. <laughs> Tell you something, if you're a single man, the best thing you can do is find a godly wife. Amen. Amen. She will kill you or cure you. Um, <laughs> Acts chapter 13 verse 22 says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. You see, 
The reason David moved his generation was because um, he was first moved by God himself. And, and, and sometimes when I look at young leaders, I see, you know what, you've got a head full of knowledge and a heart full of passion, but there's something lacking. I, 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 as a pastor, I can, I can sense that. I'm not being condescending, but there's something deficient, and I believe it's the prayer life. You know, you can come to a prayer meeting, but if, if you're just going through the motions, you might ask this morning, how do I learn how to preach? You don't. You learn how to pray. Amen. If you learn how to pray, you will know how to preach. Amen. If that's your calling. Amen. But if, if you don't know how to pray, you will never know how to preach. Amen. If you don't know how to move God in prayer, you'll never move men when you speak. Amen. That's just the way it is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, that's why I love to hear people pray. Uh, uh, is Rodrigo here this morning? On, on, on Friday night in the prayer meeting, he prayed, my God, the presence of God just filled this place when he prayed. It was beautiful. He brought some of that Brazilian fire. <laughs> Hallelujah. I encourage you, Friday nights. Personally, I believe that is the heart of this ministry, this church. It's Friday nights, the prayer meeting, coming together, praying over the nation, over the nations of the world, over what God is doing. You know, because if, if we don't have that heart, if, if, if that's not our focus, we will get off course into other things. Um, the Bible says about the parable of the sower, other things entering in uh, suff suffocate the sea. You know, it doesn't mean evil things or bad, just other things. Sometimes it's like I said, it's good things are keeping us from God things. And that's where prayer, I believe, is what um, leads us. You know, ultimately, um, knowledge... Personally, I think knowledge is about as useful as a cigarette lighter on a, on a motorbike um, or, 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 you know, a gun without a trigger. Uh, knowledge is good, but, but it's only prayer, I believe, that releases what God has placed in your heart. And, and this is what I discovered, you know, when, uh, years ago when I was, uh, after we'd been youth pastors and we were out of ministry for about four years, we'd, four years of, of, of wilderness where we had nowhere to speak and, 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 and nothing to do. And every morning I'd get up at maybe four, five, six o'clock in the morning, go for a two, three hour walk, and I'd just pray in tongues, pray in tongues, and, and, and pray in the Spirit and seek God. And, and it's in that time God birthed what was in uh, my heart. And, you know, long before I ever stood here physically, I stood here in prayer. Hallelujah. And um, you see, a spiritual call can't be entered into by physical means. It can only be entered into by spiritual means. And that's why prayer... Prayer, you, you, when you're in prayer, when you're seeking God, you're entering into a different dimension. Hallelujah. You're entering into the realm of dreams and, and dreams becoming reality, amen? amen? But seeking God, like I said, you can get some holy man to sprinkle you with oil and throw a blanket around you and do all sorts of... <laughs> and, and listen, hey, Pentecostal churches, anything goes, yeah? The weirder it is, the better, the more spiritual it must be, the weirder, you know. And I'm, I believe in the prophetic, but there's also the... Prophetic... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, sometimes just because it looks weird doesn't necessarily mean it's God, okay? <laughs> and sometimes just because it looks weird doesn't mean it's not God, but you've got you to be in prayer. But, you know, ultimately it's only God who can birth our dreams. And, um, you know, prayer enables us to step into our dreams. Mark 1 verse 35 says, Jesus rose a long time before daylight, went to a solitary place, and there he prayed. I think that's one of the most precious scriptures when it talks about the early morning hour. You know, some of my most precious times with God have been in those early morning hours. If you have children, they have to be early morning or late, or late night, amen, if you want to be on your own. But uh, there's something about getting on your own with the Lord. You know, the book of Matthew says, when you pray, shut the door behind you. And I believe that's like, turn off your phone, turn off your TV, get rid of all the distractions and just come into his presence to seek him, amen. Because we want to be his friend. We want to we wanna know him. And, um, you know, there is something about the early morning, I believe. And uh, personally, I think it's arrogant for, for us to think we can accomplish anything without first spending time with him. If that's what Jesus did, I think that should be our pattern. Amen. And um, like I said, all of us have abilities and giftings and, and intelligence. But all of that is nothing, I believe, compared to... Uh, God's presence, if we will spend time with Him first. Um, you know, we all battle with the flesh. Um, you know, we all battle with laziness and tiredness. And, you know, it's so easy as you're going to bed. And I've done this for 20 years, you know, as I go to bed. Wake me in the morning, Lord. 
And it's so easy in the morning to say, what in the name of God, Lord? You know, it's five o'clock, the birds are singing. You feel that gentle little nudge to get up and you're like, oh, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Can't be God. And it's so easy to let our, our flesh rule us, you know. But I think it's so, it's so precious to just, when we do that, to get up. Uh, as Psalm 63 says, early will I seek you. I think we could take a lesson from the birds with that regard because, you know, three or four a.m. in the morning, they start singing their praises to God. And um, I think that's a good principle. That's a good way for us to start our day is to, no matter what's going on, no matter what's going wrong, no matter what prayer has been answered or is yet to be answered, I think it's wonderful to start our day in the same way as those little birds. Jesus said they don't worry about their lunch, about their dinner, about their, about their bed. They don't have visa cards to get them through the tough times, <laughs> uh, as we all have at times. I can do all things through visa, which strengthens me. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we built this church by the power of prayer and visa. <laughs> Thankfully, it's been cleared to the glory of Jesus, but there was a time our personal visa had a limit of 10 grand and we were just about that much under the, under the, under the top, but you know what, it was, it, was, it was worth it, you know, to see what God's doing here and to see you all here this morning. Isn't it good? God is good. Let's stand to our feet, amen. If you could bow your head for one moment, I just want to ask you this question. Maybe, maybe it's your first time being in church. Um, maybe you've never... Uh, come into a service like this, I don't know, but I just want you to know that God loves you, that Jesus Christ poured out his love at the cross of Calvary, not to condemn you, but so that you could be forgiven, so that you could know the joy of being forgiven, the joy of a new beginning, the joy of experiencing God's wonderful grace. So this morning, I'd like you to give you the opportunity, if you've never asked Jesus into your life, if everybody could bow your head for one moment, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, but you would like to encounter him, you'd like to have a new beginning, you would like to receive the forgiveness that he offers to all people. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. What must you do to be saved? The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All you got to do is put your faith in Jesus, pray a simple prayer and surrender your life to him. And I'm not saying everything gets, you know, all your problems disappear overnight. But what I'm saying is this, is that you're no longer alone. None of us like to be alone, and we weren't designed to go through life alone. Emmanuel means God with us. When you surrender your life to Jesus, you have that promise that no matter what good or bad times come with you, you do not go through them alone. He said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Nobody loves you like Jesus. Jesus died at the cross so that you could know him, so that you could have his peace in your heart. So this morning, if you would like to receive Him as your Savior, if you would like to pray that simple prayer to ask Jesus into your heart, I'd like you right now to lift up your hand and I'm going to pray with you. In Jesus' name. Just lift up your hand. If you've never prayed that prayer, we're going to give you that opportunity right now in Jesus' name. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't sit there thinking, I'd like to, but I'm afraid what people will think. Every one of us at some stage had to take that step of faith to put our trust in Him. So before we finish, is there any person this morning who wants to put your hand up and say yes to Jesus?